Well, thank you very much, Terry, and the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy for continued support and organization of the Linus Pauling Memorial Lecture Series. Um, beyond, beyond honored, I'm humbled that Terry asked that I introduce this evening's speaker. Dr. James Shapiro, a professor of microbiology at the University of Chicago, though that certainly does not begin to speak to the contributions to science that he has made through his research into cells regulation of natural genetic engineering. His research has contributed to a reset of our understanding of Darwinian theories in evolution and natural selection. Not without controversy, his recently published book, Evolution, A View from the 21st Century, raises questions supported by empirical evidence that may ultimately reshape a new unifying theory in bi biology. He is on numerous ed editorial boards for distinguished journals in the areas of microbiology and received prestigious awards from the National Institutes of Health, Foundation for Microbiology, and perhaps most telling, in 1993 he received the Darwinian Pro or Darwin Prize from the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Shapiro's PhD thesis, published in 1968, contains the first suggestions of transposable elements in bacteria. He's been at this for quite some time. Since 1992, he's been writing about the importance of biologically regulated genetic engineering as a fundamental new concept in evolution science. As science chair at OES, which is a sponsor of the Linus Pauling Memorial Series, we were fortunate to have Dr. Shapiro visit our campus yesterday. He spent the morning presenting and discussing some of his fundamental findings in evolutionary science with our high school biology students. But perhaps more important for and to our students was his ability to, to discuss these findings on a level that brought it back to the principles of science, the importance of empirical evidence to support a hypothesis, and the unknowable ambiguity that all scientists work with and within. His humility was not lost on our faculty, yet our students still new to this process may not understand and recognize the pioneer in evolutionary theory and sciences that they had in their midst. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. James Shapiro. I hope people won't mind if I sit. It's more comfortable and a little bit more casual. And I want to thank the, the, the Institute and Terry and Chris uh, for that terrific introduction and thank everybody for braving the cold weather tonight and coming out uh, to talk about uh, DNA and genomes and, and evolution. And I hope we'll have a, an interesting uh, evening. Um, what, what I want to do is, is try and recapitulate what we've learned in the last 60 years uh, about genetic change and how it fits in with uh, evolution. And there have been lots of really very important discoveries. But if you look in the press or you listen to public discussions of evolution, or even if you watch debates, as I did one between Lynn Margulis and, and Richard Dawkins, it's as though the 60 years of molecular biology just never happened, and we haven't learned anything. And so if I, if I may, and I hope I don't talk too far over anybody's head, I'd like to try and put all of this into some uh, historical uh, perspective. Um, I put a quote from Barbara McClintock from her Nobel Prize speech 30 years ago uh, on the, the first slide because Barbara was the person who first showed that cells could repair and restructure their own genomes. And uh, uh, she is one of the great scientists, in my view, the greatest biologist of the 20th century and uh, is still waiting to be rediscovered uh, in uh, uh, her, her deepest uh, sense. And uh, we'll come back to Barbara in the course of, of the lecture. Now, uh, in case people fall asleep, uh, uh, find that their mental passages have been clogged up with too much detail, or I 
uh, drone on for too long and I have to cut the lecture short or something like that. Let me give you the take-home lessons in advance for what I want to say. So the first thing I'd like to say is that evolution is a complex set of processes. There's a lot going on, some of which we know, much of which we have yet to learn. And it's not reducible to simple formulas. There is no two-word summary for the processes that go on in evolution. We can't use just a phrase and say we've explained such a, a, uh, an immense and important uh, set of events that have occurred over such a long period of time. Uh, the second point, and this is really my own research and expertise, the relationship with McClintock, and uh, what I want to talk about most of all is that we need to rethink the relationship between the genome and the cells and the organisms and recognize that cells control their genomes and they use them as read-write information and data storage organelles. They're not read-only memories which change by accident. Cells actively write on their genomes, and I'll try and explain uh, uh, rather superficially, but I'll try and explain some of that in the course of the lecture. Um, th the third point is that genome writing occurs over evolutionary time as uh, genomes and DNA molecules change, and it employs a, 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 a wide variety, and we'll only be able to talk about some of them, of regulated and non-random cell and biochemical processes. Uh, in other words, uh, genetic change does not come about from chance or from accidents or mistakes. It comes about because cells actively change their DNA. If a cell has damaged DNA, for example, and is incapable of changing it or repairing it, the cell dies. It doesn't leave a, a mutant cell behind. It, it just dies. And then f the f fourth point, and I'll, I'll document this uh, for you during the, the lecture, is that there have been a number of rapid big changes that have come at critical points in evolutionary history. We don't yet understand the full implications of these big changes, but from reading the DNA genome sequence record, we can tell that they've occurred. And we know something about similar processes that we can observe in real time, and those need to be studied more intensively. Now, evolutionary uh, thinking uh, really began at the end of the 18th century and uh, uh, was stimulated by Linnaeus classifying organisms and putting them into different groups and showing that organisms uh, had relationships and, and, and families and, and defining species and genera and so forth. And uh, the pioneers in this uh, were two very interesting individuals, one in England, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles, who was the first British scientist to talk about evolution and uh, talk about uh, life going from simple organisms in a pool to complex forms over long periods of time. And then the Frenchman who has been sort of lampooned and ridiculed but is making a comeback, uh, uh, which we can discuss later, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, uh, who wrote about evolution uh, at the uh, early in the, uh, at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. Now, in, in the middle of the 19th century, and oh, and, and what, what Erasmus Darwin and Lamarck recognized, and that is really the cornerstone of evolutionary thinking, is that descent occurs with modification. That is, the progeny 
can be different from their parents, and these differences can become large over time. They didn't know how it happened, but they had the idea that life changed over time, and that that was the beginnings of our understanding of the evolutionary process. Now, the first really scientific ideas about uh, the nature of that modification came from uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin um, uh, 50 years later in the middle of the 19th century. Actually, uh, it, they were first presented at a meeting of the, the Linnaean Society in 1858. Uh, Darwin was there, Wallace was in the jungles of Malaysia. Uh, where he was collecting butterflies and other exotic beasts. Uh, and their idea was that you have kind of random variation. They, they, of course, in the middle of the 19th century, knew nothing about genetics or DNA. And then natural selection, the competition between organisms and the pressure for survival would lead to change. And that was uh, accepted as a scientific explanation uh, and uh, began the serious thinking about evolutionary science. But what was uh, not known was what is the nature of variation? And that's one of the things that we want to focus on uh, tonight. Where does change come from? Because change in the genome is what gives rise to the biological novelties that are the hallmark of evolutionary change over time. And there are a number of people who uh, studied how change occurs, how genetic differences are passed on, uh, uh, and there were various subjects like chromosome segregation, mutation, uh, a subject called epigenetics, how does the cell control the genome and then use it in different ways during animal development and so forth. And there are a number of people who typically don't get included in the evolutionary pantheon who really belong there. There's Gregor Mendel, of course, who discovered uh, the rules of, of chromosome transmission and of Mendelian factors. Uh, what later came to be uh, called uh, genes, but I think that that's Mendelian factors is a more neutral and less philosophically laden term. Uh, there's a man named Hugo de Vries who is one of the people who rediscovered Mendelian segregations in the year 1900 and had a saltational or large mutation theory of evolution. There was William Bateson in Britain who coined the term genetics and who also thought in terms of large changes occurring in evolution. Uh, a man named Richard Goldschmidt, who in the 1950s was one of the kings of genetics and has been totally written out of the textbooks now. Uh, Stephen Gould made an attempt to resuscitate him by republishing his, his book, The Material Basis of Evolution, and who is really the founder of what we now call Evo Devo. What's the relationship between evolution and embryonic development. And then a very brilliant man named Conrad Hall Waddington, who was uh, a geneticist in Britain in the uh, uh, middle of the 20th century, who came up with the idea of epigenetics. And uh, I think we'll have a little bit more to say about that uh, in, the, in the course of the evening. But all of these people contributed and our knowledge of the processes of variation uh, changed over time. And then, of course, in 1944, Oswald Avery and his colleagues showed that uh, the transforming principle in bacteria, which could convert the genetic constitution of the bacteria, was DNA. That was the first demonstration that DNA carried hereditary information. And then in 1953, the, 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 the work of Watson and Crick, showing the double helical nature of DNA and giving us an insight into the molecular basis of how hereditary information 
could be duplicated and transmitted to daughter cells. Um, now, with molecular biology came new ways of examining living organisms and their relationships. And uh, just before New Year's, uh, the person I think is the greatest evolutionist of the 20th century, a man named Carl Woese, whose picture you can see here at the upper right, passed away. And uh, Carl uh, did something quite extraordinary. He said, let's put phylogeny on a solid molecular footing. And he chose to look at the uh, RNA molecule in the machine that the bacterial, that all cells use to make their proteins. It's a structure called the ribosome. And in many cells, it's half of the total mass of the cell is composed of ribosomes. That's where RNA code gets translated into protein, amino acid sequence in proteins. And so it's very important. All cells have it. The, the ribosomes are related and can't change too much because they do such an important job. But they're different between uh, cells. And at the time, there were known to be two different kinds of cells. Cells which were called eukaryotes, which means true kernel or true nucleus. And those were cells which had a well-defined nucleus enclosed in a membrane. And that includes us. It includes algae. It includes plants. It includes lots of uh, single-celled organisms. And then there were the bacteria and other organisms which had no well-defined nucleus. And they were called prokaryotes, or meaning before, before a kernel, before a nucleus. And they were thought to be of a, a, a diverse but single group. And so Carl set out to, to examine relationships by looking at the ribosomal RNA. And what he did, he discovered at the end of the 1970s, less than 40 years ago, was that there are not two kinds of cells. There are actually three kinds of cells. They found that bacteria which produce methane and live in certain extreme environments have ribosomes that are as different from those of bacteria and eukaryotes as eukaryotes and bacteria are from each other. So less than 40 years ago, we found that our view of life was inadequate and that there are actually three kinds of cells uh, that make up uh, life. And that discovery has a lot of very important implications. Among them is the implication that we really don't know what the early history of life was like. There might have been dozens maybe hundreds or thousands of different kinds of cells which went extinct before they could leave any record that we can discern in, 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 in fossils and in rocks today. And uh, we just don't know how many types of cells there were and whether there was one single type of cell at the very beginning, which is what many people believe, or in fact there were multiple cell types. Uh, but this was a very important discovery, and this put the study of relationships between organisms on a very firm, molecular, uh, empirical basis, and it, uh, uh, it was hard to argue with this, and you could identify organisms by extracting their RNA and looking at them. Uh, people use this today to go out and do what is called metagenomics. That is, you just take a sample from the environment. This has been done in the oceans, in soils, on the human body, at different places on the human body, in our intestines, recently in the upper atmosphere. And just take all of the DNA and ask what kinds of ribosomal DNAs are there. And in this way, we can describe the organisms that are present, even though they haven't been cultured in a particular environment. And we've learned a lot about that. A lot of it is relevant to our own health, because we've learned a lot about the microorganisms that live with us and affect our health. Uh, but one of the things that we've learned that's very important and very humbling
is that we've cultured in the laboratory about 1% of all of the organisms that are present in nature. So most of life is there, we can detect it, but it's relatively unknown to us, and we've got to do a lot of work to learn more uh, uh, about it. Um, having the means of identifying organisms and where they come from and who they're related to uh, helped us solve a very important problem in evolution. And that problem is, where did the eukaryotic cell come from in the first place? It was obviously much more complex than both the bacteria and the archaea, the prokaryotic cells, and had many organelles that for a long time, there's literature going back to the 19th century of people saying, these are bacteria living inside of these larger cells. And indeed, there are bacteria living inside of the cells of many organisms, including our own, I dare say. And this idea was championed in the 1960s and 70s by the woman pictured here, Lynn Margulis, who passed away uh, at the end of 2011. And Lynn had argued for a long time that organelles like the mitochondrion shown at the bottom here on the right, which is the energy center of the cell, the thing that allows it to use oxygen to burn up sugars and produce energy for cell actions and motility and growth and development and so forth. Uh, and the chloroplast, which carries out photosynthesis in green plants and green algae and red algae and other photosynthetic organisms, that these were both the descendants of endosymbiotic bacteria and that cell fusions had contributed to the origins of the eukaryotic cell and then later of photosynthetic eukaryotic cells. And fortunately, both the mitochondrion and the chloroplast have their own ribosomes and their own DNA. And when the ribosomes were examined, the ribosomes of the mitochondrion were found to belong to one group of bacteria and the ribosomes of the chloroplast were found to be related to those of photosynthetic cyanobacteria, which carry out oxygen-producing photosynthesis. So all of the oxygen that's in the atmosphere, and I think next week or the next lecture, you're going to hear about the, the relationship between the evolution of life and the evolution of the, the planet, all of the oxygen that's in the atmosphere, and it's certainly essential for us to live, is produced by bacteria, either free-living bacteria or endosymbiotic bacteria in eukaryotic cells. And uh, what this tells us is that one of the most important events in evolution, the formation of the eukaryotic cell, since all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria or their descendants, occurred from a cell fusion event. It wasn't accumulating random mutations. It was a cell fusion event which brought the, the metabolic capabilities of two different cells, and perhaps more than two, together, and brought their genomes together, and that was a huge step in evolution. So that's what I mean when I say there are some very rapid, large steps that we know have occurred in evolution, and we don't have all of the details, we don't know when this happened exactly, we don't know how many fusions there were involved, but we do know that the mitochondria and the chloroplast are descended from free-living bacteria. And that was a very major discovery and a major change in our thinking about what kind of processes can be involved in evolutionary novelty. Now, uh, you might say, well, maybe this was an extraordinary or an exceptional or a rare event, and uh, one of the things that we've learned from genome sequences, and this is a figure which I don't think you're going to be able to read, but it's a phylogeny of all of the eukaryotic organisms. And what it illustrates, and if I can get the cursor here, is the original endosymbiosis which produced the mitochondrion, which occurred in the ancestor of all existing eukaryotes, including ourselves. And then 
the endosymbiotic event which created the first photosynthetic eukaryotic cell, which was the ancestor of green algae and of red algae and of another uh, group of uh, non-photosynthetic organisms called glaucophytes. You don't have to worry about that. But what has also been discovered is that endosymbiosis didn't end, or symbiogenesis didn't end. So there are a lot of photosynthetic organisms like euglena, which belong to groups of non-photosynthetic organisms because secondary endosymbiosis has occurred and cell, a, a cell has merged with an algae. Now, that creates a cell which has four different genome compartments. It has a nucleus, it has a mitochondrion, it has the plastid, which is in the algae, and it has the former nucleus of the algae, which is called a nucleomorph. And after these symbiogenetic events occur, we know from looking at these primary and secondary and even tertiary endosymbiotic events the DNA gets moved around and transferred from the endosymbiont into the nucleus of the cell. So the mitochondrion and the chloroplast are no longer capable of independent existence because they've lost much of their genetic capacity and it's now encoded in the nucleus of the cell and the proteins that the mitochondrion and chloroplast need to operate are synthesized along with other proteins of the cell and then have to be imported into those organelles. So symbiogenesis is, has been an active process and as far as we know it's still going on. There are photosynthetic animals that have cyanobacteria living in their skin cells. Uh, there are plants which don't have any roots but use fungi to do their roots. There's symbiotic relationships all over biology, and they have tremendous implications for evolution. Um, now, I'm a, a, a bacterial geneticist, and uh, I got that, that way a little bit by serendipity, but I was very fortunate to work with a man whose photograph is over here, William Hayes, who was one of the great uh, early bacterial geneticists in the 1950s and 1960s. And uh, he's the man who discovered plasmids, which are pieces of DNA which bacterial cells can transfer back and forth. And when I was his student, he was writing the second edition of his textbook, The Genetics of Bacteria and Their Viruses. And among other things, he was describing how bacteria were thought to evolve antibiotic resistance. And there was a coherent, well thought out, theory of antibiotic resistance consistent with prevailing ideas of evolutionary change that there would be mutations. The mutations would alter the bacterial cells and the alterations would make them less sensitive or impermeable to the antibiotics and they would become resistant. And for some antibiotics they could accumulate multiple mutations giving them high levels of resistance. And uh, this, this idea was confirmed experimentally in the 1950s by microbiologists going out, bacteriologists, and isolating the resistant mutants and repeating this process and showing that it worked. Now, the bacteria that became resistant typically were, were mutants and didn't grow as well as their ancestors, their, 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 the, the original sensitive bacteria. And so the idea was that antibiotic resistance would not be a serious problem in nature and actually acting on this idea in 1969 the Surgeon General of the United States issued a report saying that we don't have to worry about infectious disease anymore we've got antibiotics. Well as George W. Bush would say we misunderestimated the bacteria. <laughs> the um, Bacteria were cleverer than we were, and they didn't evolve antibiotic resistance this way. They did it as illustrated in this cartoon. Uh, what's shown here is a member of the antibiotic resistance. That's why he's wearing a trench coat and a fedora hat. And he's saying to this uh, antibiotic-sensitive bacteria coming from the hospital, 
saying, hey, kid, do you want to become a superbug? Do you want to become resistant? Take this piece of DNA. And what was unknown at the time, but what I knew was going on, because in, the, in Bill Hayes' laboratory were working two women, Eleanor Maynell and Naomi Dada, studying the transfer of antibiotic resistance from one strain of bacteria to another by the same kinds of plasmids that Bill Hayes had discovered. And there was important work on this by uh, Japanese people who really were the pioneers in this area and discovered that bacteria did not become resistant to antibiotics by mutation, but by what we now call horizontal transfer of DNA in the form of plasmids or sometimes as naked DNA that's called transformation, or sometimes DNA picked up by viruses and injected into the bacterial cells. And that's illustrated here. So those processes are called transformation when a cell takes up DNA from the environment. And all kinds of cells can do this, not just bacteria. Human cells and tissue culture do this. Plant cells can do this in tissue culture. There's conjugation where plasmids make elaborate structures, like the structures used to take up DNA from the environment to transfer DNA from cell to cell, or this process called transduction, where a virus picks up a piece of DNA and infects another cell, and rather than injecting viral DNA, injects a piece of bacterial DNA. And what this transfer DNA does is encode enzymes and proteins and other systems which allow the bacteria to become resistant. They do that by uh, inactivating the antibiotics or by producing pumps which pump the antibiotics out of the cell. That's how cells become resistant to tetracycline, for example. Or in some cases, even by modifying the structure of the targets of the antibiotic in the cell, so they're no longer inhibited by the antibiotics. Is, is the sound okay? Okay. And then there are all kinds of other DNA rearrangement processes, some of which I'll talk about, which build up pieces of segments of DNA which get larger and larger and have more and more resistances in them using special DNA rearrangement systems possessed by the, the, the bacterial cells. So we, we misunderestimated them by a lot, but they taught us some important evolutionary lessons. But now we're faced with the problem that multiple antibiotic resistance is making many antibiotics unusable and many bacterial diseases hard to treat. And it's a, a very serious public health problem. Now, horizontal transfer doesn't just occur between bacteria or as has been amply documented between archaea and bacteria which swap DNA back and forth so they can live in all the different environments they live in. And this is another example of a very rapid form of evolutionary change where you can pick up a whole pathway in a few minutes by a DNA transfer. What's shown here is DNA are eukaryotic organisms, nematode worms, uh, which have on multiple occasions developed the ability to grow on plants. Now, a nematode is a soft-bodied organism, and it can't chew the plants. So it has to dissolve the plant cell wall to get at the goodies inside enzymatically, and it needs the enzymes which do that. And these are called glycosyl hydrolases, or GH for short. And what you see here is a picture of the evolution of different families of plant parasitic nematodes. And they all have different glycosyl hydrolases. And when you look at the glycosyl hydrolases, they're not related to those of other nematodes. They're related to those of bacteria, or in some cases of fungi. So bacteria and fungi can transfer these activities to these nematode worms so they can live on plants. And for the nematodes, it's much more handy to pick up an already evolved enzymatic activity from a bacterium or a fungus than it is to go through the long process of evolving that activity itself. And this can go the other way. Uh, bacteria can pick up uh, uh, DNA from 
uh, mammalian or, or eukaryotic hosts and use that DNA when they invade and become pathogenic or, or symbiotic uh, in, our, in our bodies. So there's DNA transfer going back and forth all over the place, and we still do not yet know the full extent of it. So your inheritance is not just from your ancestors. Uh, it comes also in horizontally from other kinds of organisms, sometimes from wholly different kingdoms of life um, in these three different kingdoms. Now, uh, let's look at another issue. What happens when you damage the DNA uh, of cells? And this is where Barbara McClintock was a pioneer. This is not what she got the Nobel Prize for. She got the Nobel Prize for discovering that pieces of DNA could move from place to place. And we'll come to that shortly. But in the 1930s, she began to study how x-rays caused mutations. And at the time, the prevailing idea was that x-rays caused what were called gene mutations. They altered the form of these entities called genes and changed their structure so that they developed new, what were called alleles, which is Greek for new forms uh, of the genes. And Barbara went in and started studying these uh, x-ray-induced mutants, especially ones which were very unstable. And she came to the conclusion that what the x-rays were doing was breaking the chromosomes. And then the cells could take the broken ends and join them together. And if a chromosome got broken near its ends, and then the broken ends were joined together, you'd form a ring chromosome which would be very unstable at cell division and could lead to some of the instabilities that were observed in these plants. And she wrote a letter about this hypothesis to her colleagues at Berkeley and Yale. Uh, they made fun of it. Uh, the next year, Barbara went out and looked at the unstable plants and found the ring chromosomes. So what she showed was that uh, the maize plants, the cells of the maize plants, could take broken chromosomes and fix them. They could join broken ends together and repair damage to the genome. And once she'd started doing this work, she elaborated on it. As I say, I think she was a, a really fantastic scientist, and found ways to artificially induce breaks and then follow them so she could observe the process of joining together of the broken ends in real time. And one of the important things that we need to think about when we think about evolution science is what do we learn from looking at the past record, whether it's the DNA record or the fossil record or the anatomical record, but then what can we reproduce in real time and observe under our own eyes in the laboratory and figure out how things work. So Barbara did this work, and she came to an amazing conclusion. As I said, she was given the Nobel Prize for showing that pieces of DNA could move from place to place. But she didn't say anything about how she showed that in her Nobel Prize lecture. Her Nobel Prize lecture was all about what she learned about what plants could do with their genomes. And so let me just read what she concluded from her studies on chromosome breakage. She wrote, the conclusion seems inescapable that cells are able to sense the presence in their nuclei of ruptured ends of chromosomes and then to activate a mechanism that will bring together and then unite these ends one with another. The ability of a cell to sense these broken ends, to direct them toward each other, and then to unite them so that the union of the two DNA strands is correctly oriented is a particularly revealing example of the sensitivity of cells to all that is going on within them. There must be numerous homeostatic adjustments required of cells. Lots of mistakes happen, but the cells are not defenseless against them. The sensing devices and the signals that initiate these adjustments are beyond our present ability to fathom. That was 30 years ago. We've learned a lot about these processes since, but I think the statement still stands because there's a lot that we still have to learn. A goal for the future would be to determine the extent of knowledge the cell has of itself and how it utilizes this knowledge in a thoughtful manner when challenged. 
Now that's the kind of language which I and many other scientists are taught never to use, never to anthropomorphize, never to ascribe intention to anything biological. That's just taboo. But here's McClintock telling us something that she saw with her own eyes, that is the chromosomes would break and the cells could figure out how to fix the breaks. And they could do it very quickly and very efficiently. In a, a 2009 book, a neurophysiologist uh, turned bacterial behaviorist, Dennis Bray, published a book called Wetware, a computer in every living cell. And he said that McClintock was the first biologist to ask, what does a cell know about itself? Actually, some of the early developmental biologists asked similar questions. But uh, this is a, an element of, of cell biology which is going to be a main focus in this century and is an added element where we still remain uh, very ignorant. Now, uh, let's look at some more things that we've learned about evolution through studying DNA now that we know that cells can break their DNA and join it back together. Uh, in effect, cells can do what is, is genetic engineering. They can cut and splice DNA. That's why I call it natural genetic engineering. And what we've learned is that a lot of evolutionary change occurs by uh, this break, cut and splice process. This is a figure from the first paper in the journal Nature on the draft human genome in February of 2001. It's a historic paper. It's the longest paper ever published in the journal Nature, which is the most prestigious of all science journals uh, published in Britain. And what this shows is a series of related proteins in different organisms. Y stands for yeast. W stands for worms or nematodes like we saw before. F stands for flies, or Drosophila, and V stands for vertebrates, meaning mice and men, uh, the two mammals that, whose genomes had been sequenced. And what you can see is the proteins evolve, they have these segments which appear repeatedly, and they're called domains, and they're found in different proteins, and they're found in multiple copies in proteins, and proteins evolve not by changing one amino acid at a time, but by picking up and shuffling and rearranging and what's called accreting these domains. And these domains can range in size from a dozen to several hundred amino acids in length. That means that the DNA which encodes those domains has to be cut and spliced and put together in new arrangements. And cells have all the activities that they, uh, that they need to do that uh, uh, we may talk about that later on, how that happens. And if you think about it, this is obviously a much more efficient way of evolving new functions in proteins than changing them one amino acid at a time, as conventional theory would have it, by replication mistakes, because the domains themselves already have structure and function, and you can put them in new combinations. The combinatorial diversity is virtually unlimited and create mixed together different biochemical functions in one protein and create new functionalities for the cell or for the organism. And this is more efficient and more likely to produce something that works than doing a blind changing one amino acid at a time. There are many proteins which just don't have the basic structure to be changed into something else that might be needed by the organism. So this is another lesson that came out of doing the human genome sequence and earlier out of uh, analyzing the sequences of many proteins and finding that they had these shared domains. And of course, the domains have a common ancestry and there have to be the, the, the mechanisms inside the cells for amplifying the sequences which encode these domains so you can get many copies of them and rearrange them and assort them and join them together. Now, uh, I want to say something about the concept of the gene, because uh, in, in my opinion, that's been a, uh, perhaps a useful concept that we had, 
But it's not useful anymore because it leads us to an oversimplified view of how the genome and DNA uh, works. The original idea was, and I think the idea that you still read about when you read newspaper articles, is that there's a gene for this character and a gene for that character, and you put them together and you get a whole bunch of characters, and that's what makes an organism. And certainly, the, 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 the population genetic argument for how evolution occurs is by genes rearranging in different combinations and giving you different functionalities. Well, it turns out that that's not the way things work. There are sequences which code for proteins. We know that they can be broken up into exons and introns. That was discovered in the 1970s. We know that there are regulatory sequences which determine whether those coding sequences get expressed or not expressed. There are other regulatory sequences which determine whether the DNA is replicated or not and so forth and so on. So what we have are different kinds of genetic elements that work together in combinations to create functions, sometimes to make proteins. And then as we see here, this is uh, a Drosophila, and this is a mouse embryo, and this is taken from a Scientific American article on the Hox complex which it turns out was a key invention way back in the Ediacaran era, about 580 million years ago, which was essential for defining the bilateral body plan of animals. And the Hox complex, in this case, determines the, anter the anterior, from the head to the, to the um, back of the abdomen, to the posterior, body uh, function. It, uh, these are key kind of, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, uh, microprocessors which transmit signals and tell part, different parts of the body what they should be doing and what limbs they should be making and so forth. And we find that this is duplicated in, in us and in other mammals as well, and in some cases does the same job it does in Drosophila. So certain complex structures or systems are duplicated and maintained in evolution, and they're responsible for development. There is no single gene which tells a wing to be a wing. A wing is, a, is organized by many complex functions working together, and the fact that a wing is positioned at this site in the Drosophila is determined by the action of the, the, the Hox complex. And if you change that action, you can get a fly which actually has four wings. It looks like a dragonfly rather than a Drosophila. And uh, a lot of these functions are, are controlled by combinations of what are called transcription factors. These are proteins which control how the DNA is expressed. And what's shown here is an early Drosophila embryo which has to be divided up into different segments so the different segments of the Drosophila can develop and below the early embryo is the, is the larva that forms, it's one of the first stages of growth of the insect and there are all these different transcription factors and they're all organized in different spatial arrangements so they have different concentration gradients and the different concentration gradients and the combinations of these factors are what give the segmental identity to different parts of the Drosophila embryo. And there's a very lovely article in the Scientific American by Christian Nusslein Volhart on this process for which she received the Nobel Prize in, I think, in 1999. Uh, and so again, it's, it's an, a system and a network not an individual part of the genome, which is what determines what the organism is like. Now, that raises a very important question. If different parts of the genome are making different proteins, and as we're learning nowadays, different RNA molecules, which work together to carry out development and carry out other aspects of biological function and morphogenesis, how do these networks evolve? How do networks including 
genetic loci at different parts of the genome evolve so that they work together. And uh, if they had to do this by one random change after another at each location, it would take an impossibly long time. What we really need is a way to sprinkle signals through the genome and put them at all these different locations rapidly. Now, to how many people in this audience does that sound like a ridiculous idea? Well, nobody's raised his hand, so maybe I'm, I'm saying things that you already know. But it turns out that the most abundant DNA in our genomes, and in many genomes, is composed precisely of these mobile genetic elements, the things that McClintock was the first to discover, which are basically DNA cassettes which can move from one place to another and bring with them a whole series of signals that can format different genetic loci. And uh, does anybody know what percentage of our DNA encodes for our proteins? What was that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's between 1.2 and 1.5 percent. It's a very small percentage of our DNA. Three percent of our DNA is made up of DNA transposons, or their defective descendants. Those are pieces of DNA which can move around and happen to be the DNA uh, which McClintock discovered in maize, the, the mobile elements, and which were discovered later in bacteria. Uh, about uh, 450,000 copies of sequence related to retroviruses, HIV is a retrovirus, which have a characteristic structure with these long repeats at the ends, or their deleted derivatives. They make up about 8% of the total DNA, and they are uh, another important class of mobile sequence in, in the genome. We know, for example, that retroviruses were involved in the evolution of the placenta when eutherian mammals, which have placenta, diverged from marsupials. So without endogenous retroviruses, sorry folks, we wouldn't be here. So uh, these are very important elements, and uh, they get expressed sometimes. So when a, a placenta is developing, a lot of endogenous retrovirus gets produced. And then there are, and they're called retrovirus, which means backwards, because they are copied as RNA and then reverse transcribed from RNA back into DNA and inserted at a new location in the genome. So their number obligatorily increases with time, and they can carry a whole constellation of information from one place to another and affect the functioning of the genome in the new location. And then there are these other classes of retrotransposons, which are called lines and signs. That simply means long interspersed nucleotide element or short, short interspersed nucleotide element. And there's only about 2.3 million of those that were identified in the initial draft sequencing. And altogether, this was about 44% of our DNA and meant that our genomes involved over, uh, I think it's over 3 million transposition and retrotransposition events in our evolution. So they're pretty important to us. And if you want to know what makes a, a man different from a mouse, Groucho Marx said, throw a piece of cheese on the floor and you'll find out. But there's a molecular way, and it's by looking at these signs. We have a million and a half of copies of this thing called ALU, which are our signs. But mice don't have alus. They have a total different group of, alu, of uh, sign elements, which are important parts of their genome and important parts of how they evolve. So there's a lot in our genome which is not the classically defined genetic information. There are these repetitive elements, which are tremendously important in organizing the genome and organizing its function. And there's now a project uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health called the ENCODE project. Uh, ENCODE means the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. No talk of genes anymore. DNA elements, whatever they are, and trying to figure out without any presuppositions what they are, how they work, and what they do. And they've demonstrated that much of this supposedly repetitive, uninformational DNA
is very active and active in very specific ways in different kinds of cells. Here's a slide illustrating some of the ways that a mobile element can change the function of a region of the genome containing a coding sequence. They can bring in signals which change the epigenetic configuration. That's determining whether long regions of the genome are turned on or turned off or identified for special function in the genome. They can contain signals for transcription, for copying of the genome into RNA. They can contain signals for transcribing the genome in the opposite direction, off the opposite DNA strand into RNA, and that makes an antisense RNA which inhibits function. And then they can be targets or producers of these small microRNAs, which we're learning nowadays play such an important and uh, still fairly mysterious role in regulation, but are very abundant in all organisms and are doing amazing things that we were told really could never happen. This is a slide illustrating the, the sort of sprinkling that I was telling you about of these mobile elements throughout the genome and then uniting different regions of them by having common binding proteins or proteins which affect their RNAs in common ways or by making these RNAs and then affecting the chromatin structure of these different genetic loci at different parts of the genome. These are, these are built-in um, tools for rapidly constructing networks in, in the genome. And uh, I think I've got it here. Yes, there was a paper published at the end of, of 2011 where they looked at the human genome and compared it with the 29 other vertebrate genomes that had been sequenced at the time. And I'll just read what they said. They said, our data revealed more than 280,000 mobile element acceptations. Acceptation is a fancy word for an adaptation that comes from one thing and then it's adapted and changed to do another. So, uh, 280,000 different adaptations common to mammalian genomes, that is in all the mammalian genomes, covering about 7 million base pairs, a considerable expansion from the approximately 10,000 previously recognized cases. So these guys have played a really important role in evolution. And they go on, of the approximately 1.1 million constrained elements that arose during the 90 million years between the divergence from marsupials and the eutherian radiation, that is, placental mammals, we can trace over 19% to mobile element acceptations. So this stuff, which is still called by some people junk DNA, it just pains me when they say that, uh, is been a useful tool in mammalian evolution, and we know in the evolution of lots of other organisms. Uh, over time. And th these are part of the genetic engineering capacity of the cells because when one of these elements moves to a new location, it's a whole complex coordinated biochemical process that it is in no way an accident or a mistake. It's a dedicated process of movement of information from one place to another. Uh, now, uh, let's ask, how do we how does genome change get triggered? How does evolution actually occur? You know, nobody's ever made a new species by selection. I'm saying that in, in ignorance of all the experiments that have been done, but I put that on my blog, and I've gotten some answers, but nobody has ever pointed me to a reference where a new species has been created by anybody doing a selection experiment. Selection doesn't create species. We have created new species. We've created them in agriculture, and we've created them in uh, horticulture. We do it by hybridizing different species. And this is from a, a, a 1951 article in Scientific American called Cataclysmic Evolution by a man named G. Ledyard Stebbins, who was one of the leading evolutionists of the time. And he was tracing back, where does the wheat that we use to make flour come from? It arose in the Middle East approximately 10,000 years ago, and he shows that you can take two wild grasses from the Middle East and hybridize them, 
and get something that looks like modern flour yeast, uh, flour uh, wheat, excuse me. So hybridization is a very important process and mixes the genomes of different species together. Now, one of the things that happens when two different genomes come together is the normal controls over their replication and transmission are changed. Oftentimes the plants are sterile, but sometimes they duplicate their genomes and that allows them to be unsterile, that allows them to go through meiosis and produce gametes. And that's a process called whole genome doubling or whole genome duplication. And lo and behold, the DNA record tells us that the evolution is full of whole genome duplications. We find in lots of genomes duplicated segments from all over the genome, and either they all arose independently, and that's not completely excluded, or the whole genome duplicated and then parts of the duplicated segments got lost, which is something we can follow in real time and we know happens. And uh, whole genome duplications are very common in plants. It explains why plants diverge so rapidly after first appearing. Darwin called this the abominable mystery, the explosive radiation of flowering plants. But it turns out that the, there, there are two major genome duplications in the history of animal evolution, and they're in the history of our evolution. The first duplication is when vertebrates separated from chordates, so something associated with making a skeleton was also associated with doubling the genome, and what the details are we don't know, but they coincide in the genomic record. And then when jawed vertebrates separated from uh, what are called cyclostomes, vertebrates that have round mouths like lampreys and hagfish, there was a second whole genome duplication. And then later there was a third one when certain groups of bony fishes arose, and there's actually a fourth one when trouts and salmon diverged from these other fishes. So the process of duplicating the whole genome, which is not a limited change, must occur within a single generation is a rapid, multi-character change, has been critical to the evolution of fungi, of yeasts, of plants, of certain animals, us, uh, of uh, other uh, kinds of organisms, of protozoa, and uh, these events are there in the DNA record, and we don't know how they relate directly to the formation of novel adaptations and novel functions in these organisms, but if you think about it, when you've got two copies of your genome, you've got all of the networks and systems that you had in the first place, so you can do all of those jobs, and you've got an additional copy of every network and system to play around with and try and do something different. That makes a lot of sense if you want to change the character of the organism and create a genomic invention. Uh, this is just uh, 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 an indication of how we know about these duplications. Drosophila have a single copy of the Hox complex. Amphioxus, a chordate, has a single copy of the Hox complexes. Mice and humans have four copies of the Hox complex. We've lost pieces of them. They do some of the same jobs as I told you before, but they do additional jobs in, in morphogenesis and development and the system has become more complex and capable of doing more difficult morphogenetic tasks than, than the invertebrates uh, could carry out. Other regulatory proteins become duplicated and, in fact, quadruplicated in the process of these to two whole genome duplications. So uh, we see that the, the the symbiogenesis can bring about evolutionary change. The transmission of DNA horizontally can bring about evolutionary change rapidly. That hybridization can bring about change. And I must say that some of the early pioneers of evolutionary thinking, including Lamarck and later then McClintock, also emphasized the importance of hybridization. And there is a whole field of evolutionary biology called hybrid speciation but it's not seen as central, whereas uh, the evidence seems to indicate that maybe it should be central to our thinking about evolution. Now, hybridization is one of many stimuli uh, 
that are able to trigger genetic change and these active processes that cells use to remodel their, their DNA. I see I'm running a little over time. I hope you'll bear with me. I don't have too much longer uh, to go. Is, are, are people tired? Okay, all right, so we'll carry on. So McClintock showed that chromosome breaks stimulate genetic change and, in fact, activate the, the mobile elements that she found. She played a trick on her maize plants. She gave them only one broken end rather than two, and they couldn't join one broken end together, and that drove them crazy, and they activated their mobile elements, and that's how she discovered mobile elements. And that's the point she makes, one of the points she makes in her Nobel Prize lecture. There are certain kinds of mobile elements and other genetic engineering rearrangement functions which are triggered by pheromones, hormones, and cytokines, cell signaling molecules. I'll show you in a second an experiment that I did where starvation turns it on. DNA damage, of course, triggers genetic change. It damages the DNA, and there are many chemicals which damage DNA and are known to be mutagenic. And they induce repair processes, and part of the repair processes are error-prone processes which actually introduce mutations. They're not just a, a passive consequence of damage to the DNA. Antibiotics and other toxins, pressure sending off into space has been shown. Protoplasting with plants and taking off their cell walls and growing them in tissue culture. And then infections are a very important source of genetic instability. Bacterial or fungal infections and endosymbiosis can trigger genome instability. Changes in DNA content and hybridization, as I mentioned. So if the genome doubles, it upsets the controls, and you see episodes of genetic instability and innovation and restructuring of the genome. The experiment I did is shown here, and there's an awful lot of information on this slide, and I don't expect you to, 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 to get it all, and it's probably too small to see. But on the left is shown the molecular process by which one of these mobile elements in bacteria can join together two protein coding sequences and make a hybrid protein. It's a little bit like the domain accretion and domain swapping I told you about earlier. And on the right here in this graph is shown the number of fusion colonies which I detected on the selection plates, and if I can find the cursor, and the number of days I had to incubate the plates to find them. I did this experiment because this technique for making fused proteins was used by a student of mine, a former student of mine. He was working with one of my colleagues. And when I went to the student's wedding, he said he was using this technique and he had to have thick Petri dishes. And I said, thick Petri dishes, why is that? And he said, well, it takes a long time for the colonies to appear. I said, wow, that sounds really interesting. You should study that. And I kept saying, you should study that for two years, and I couldn't convince him. So I had to do it myself. <laughs> and I did it. And what I found was that when I plated the bacteria, no colonies came up in the first two or three days of incubation. And I could show by doing reconstruction experiments, seeding my populations with one or two of the altered bacteria, that had they been present, they would have formed the colony within two days. So no colonies, no fusions were formed during normal growth. That in itself was an astonishing result. But after four or five or, or days or weeks, it depended from plate to plate, it was like the bacteria developed acne, and colonies would start popping up on the Petri dish until the Petri dish was saturated with hundreds of colonies. And I calculated, I did various experiments to try and get some numbers about this, that the, 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 the quantitative increase in the frequency of these genetic rearrangements after the starvation of putting the cells on the, on the Petri dish and they couldn't use any of the, the sugars that were in the Petri dish was over 100,000 fold, excuse me. That's five orders of magnitude. That's a pretty significant increase. So starvation is a major trigger of genetic instability, and this has since been confirmed in, in other uh, bacterial and microbial situations uh, as well. I don't think it's been, uh, people have tried to duplicate it with larger organisms like Drosophila yet, but I'm sure that will come one day. We do know that infections 
can be mutagenic in, in, in Drosophila. So let me close by going back to McClintock's idea of the cell as a sensory entity, as a sensitive organ, with the genome as a sensitive organ of the cell, and the cell always watching over and monitoring its genome. And I've spared you some molecular biology slides documenting that process in detail, uh, but some of the people here who've heard earlier lectures can say we, we do know about those monitoring processes to some degree. Uh, what, what, how could evolution occur, and how can evolutionary change be tied to what's happening in the ecology, which is something that the classical evolutionists tell us is impossible. They base this on a doctrine called Weismannism from a, a late 19th century evolutionist called August Weismann, who looked at animals and saw that they had separated germ lines early in development and said that the germ line is separate from the rest of the organism and therefore it gets no information from it. Now, of course, animals are unusual in this respect. Microbes have no separate germ line. Plants have no separate germ line. Flowers develop out of somatic stalks. So other organisms and protozoa and other organisms don't have separated germ lines. So this is a, a, a zoocentric view, certainly not a, a total biological view. And what we've seen is that these stimuli, which can trigger these activities which restructure the genome, are, are uh, a good entree into thinking about this problem. So let us suppose that there's been a major ecological disruption. It could be the asteroid which hit the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs. It could be massive volcanism. It could be global climate change, putting too much CO2 into the environment. We may be engaging in an evolutionary experiment that I don't think we're going to find very pleasant. So that could be going on. All kinds of things can disrupt the ecology. What happens? Well, the population drops. Uh, the population is depleted. Food sources are depleted. Adaptive needs of organisms are not met. All of a sudden, you can't find somebody to mate with. So you're more likely to mate with somebody from a different species than you were beforehand because you can't find the mate. And that would stimulate these hybridization events which stimulate the change. You may be starving, and that may stimulate change. Uh, you may get an infection that you normally would not have gotten, and that can stimulate change. So we can have big change triggered by all of these processes starvation, cell fusions, interspecific hybridization, symbiogenesis can go on. And we get uh, major episodes of horizontal transfer, genome rearrangements, and novel symbiotic associations. Now remember, the ecology has been disrupted. It's not as competitive as it was before. Selection is reduced. The, fight, the struggle for existence isn't as hard as it was. So even a very poor novelty may provide some utility to an organism where it wouldn't in a full ecology. So in this depleted ecology, new cellular and genome architectures which have complex novelties may get established, and there may be a lot of whole genome duplication going on and new uh, networks being formed. This is all speculation, mind you. This is not documented. And then those organisms which have these maybe marginally useful novelties will begin to proliferate. But then they'll change, keep on changing until the environment is put back to, to, to full and the ecology becomes normal again. And those novelties will improve over time and they will evolve and get fine-tuned by processes of microevolution. And so uh, what we may see is that we have this episodic pattern of evolution. And if you look at the fossil record, that's exactly what is seen there. I'm sure most of you have heard of Stephen Gould and Niles Eldridge's idea of, of punctuated equilibrium, where organisms stay the same for long periods of time and then change abruptly. That's part of it. But the other thing is that there have been these episodes of mass extinctions. I think there's seven or nine of them well documented in the fossil record. And every episode of mass extinction is followed 
rapidly in the geological record, that can still be millions of years, we don't know, by mass originations and often by the formation of new types of organisms like the animal forms which are found in the Cambrian explosion or the rapid diversification of flowering plants that was observed, at, I think it was about 500 or 600 million years ago. So there's lots of room now in what we've learned from DNA and molecular biology for thinking about evolutionary processes in a very complex and interactive fashion. And I just think it's a, a dreadful pity that when you hear people talk about these things uh, on the press or on television, it's as though all of this stuff never happened. But it's happened. It's real. There are thousands of papers documenting it. And we know, as I said at the beginning, evolution is a complex process. It's an intriguing process. And I think the 21st century is going to be a very exciting century for evolution science. And I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk also. I appreciate it. My question is uh, the retrotransposons, line signs, and also uh, endogenous retroviruses, yeah. do they insert randomly after they jump around in the chromosomes? Uh, I, I forgot to point out that, that uh, uh, none of these things work randomly. If you look at them closely enough, you always see patterns. So for example, HIV has a different insertion pattern with respect to where it goes in the genome than do it does a different retrovirus. Some retroviruses like to go to the starts where transcription begins and don't like to go into coding sequences. HIV likes to go into coding sequences. Maybe it likes to do damage to the cell it inserts in, I don't know. Uh, uh, there are lots of well-documented examples of, of various kinds of targeting of movement of different uh, transposable elements, mobile genetic elements. And we know the molecular basis of this, and it's based upon all the principles of molecular biology that we teach our students all the time. Proteins recognize DNA sequences. Proteins recognize other proteins. DNA sequences can, count, uh, are, can have sequence similarity and can, can hybridize with each other. RNA can hybridize with DNA. And most important, and one that's used in the immune system uh, quite significantly, is that DNA rearrangements can be coupled with transcription, which we know can be exquisitely targeted by the cell depending upon the biological situation it finds itself in. And in the immune system, for example, after making an antibody that's successful, the cell has to target it to the right place in the body, and this is done by a DNA rearrangement process called class switch recombination. And what class of antibody you make determines where it goes in the body. So IgG goes into your bloodstream. IgA goes onto a mucosal surface. Well, the class switch recombination determines whether you make IgG or IgA. And where that happens is determined by where transcription occurs in a small switch region in the, in the, the, the DNA of the antibody producing cell. And that's transcription is turned on by signals from other cells in the immune system. So they're telling the immune system where to make a double-stranded break in the DNA so that you can then construct an antibody synthesizing piece of DNA which will target the antibody to the appropriate place in the body. I think that's just a, a mind-blowing example of something we've all been told can't happen. Cells can signal each other and condition where genome rearrangements occur. And I think that, that there's lots of cases, additional cases I could cite, but I think that, that, that one will be sufficient. So you've discussed some of how a bit of uh, infection can affect the human genome and genetics and such. Um, is there any evidence suggesting the impact of efforts to control and eradicate infectious diseases infectious diseases on our own genetic diversity? 
Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I should say that, that one of the great success stories uh, of modern uh, infectious disease uh, diseases is the fact that now AIDS is a treatable disease. HIV can be stopped. And one of the th reasons it can be stopped is that people have studied the process by which the HIV retrovirus inserts its DNA into the genome. And one of the three drugs that people take is a, an insertion blocker, an integration blocker which came directly from studies of HIV mobility in, in, in the genome. Uh, as I said, retroviruses were important at certain stages of evolution, and uh, uh, they could be in the future. Our evolution seems to have slowed down. Mice seem to be evolving a lot faster than we are. They have a lot more young mobile genetic elements, and they're more active than ours are. Most of ours have gone kind of quiet. We're a little bit dull from an evolutionary point of view. Of course, there's a lot of work on, on how we got to be dull and how we got to be what we are, and people are finding out some of the processes that were involved. So uh, I don't know of any particular example, but there are active retroviral infections going around in certain animals, and maybe it will lead to evolutionary changes in them. And I think that people should uh, be on the lookout for that. And the other thing is we can try and, and, and create a situation in the laboratory where we can do that with, say, mice or some other rapidly reproducing organism. Drosophila would be a good case. And uh, try and, and, and uh, do real-time evolution, not by the old-fashioned way, but by the new way, and see if we can trigger genome instability, do some hybridizations or things like that, and get new adaptations out of these experiments. I think we've got to become a little bit bolder in our experimentation. It's been difficult to do these things because the taboos imposed by the conventional evolutionists are very strong, and it's hard to get funding for this kind of research. But I think as the, the discoveries just mount up at the DNA level, it's going to become inevitable. So that's a long-winded answer yes. to a, a straightforward question, <laughs> and the answer is, well, we don't really know. <laughs> uh, could you make some general comments on cancer and its different uh, etiologies and possible therapies, and how it integrates with your theories? Yeah. Uh, cancer is a very interesting question. I went to a workshop on evolution and cancer in, in Tempe, Arizona about a year ago, a little under a year ago. And uh, there was this idea out there that the cancer cell was like a primitive cell. It was de-differentiated, and, and that's why it grew in an uncontrolled fashion. But a de-differentiated cell is going to get swallowed up by the immune system and knocked off by all kinds of defense mechanisms that cells have. There was a very impressive talk there from a man from Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in New York uh, Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, where they could, with a new microscopic technique, follow the track of breast cancer in living mice. And what they discovered was that the metastasizing breast cancer cells, and it's the metastasis which is lethal in breast cancer, not the original tumor, behaved in the same way as embryonic breast cells did when they were first establishing a breast. So it's not a de-differentiation, it's a re-differentiation for cells to do things that they're programmed to do, but in different environments where normally they would be prevented or would be removed by the immune system or killed by other cells. And uh, of course we know that there's lots of genome change that goes on in cancer cells, and the more virulent they become, the more metastatic they become, the more the changes are. Uh, I think... Uh, if starting to look at these changes as the results of cell processes rather than as random accidents is going to help us a lot in understanding why different cancers develop in different ways. I think it's going to be a combination of what the cell originally was differentiated to do and then what happens as a result of the genetic changes that are introduced in them. I have a colleague uh, Janet Rowley, who's very famous for discovering something called the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a common chromosome translocation that occurs repeatedly, uh, 
and is involved in certain lymphomas. Other lymphomas occur because the DNA rearrangement system of the immune system goes awry and makes chromosome translocations and activates the BRC locus and then leads to oncogenic transformation in breast cells. So there's lots of connections, but there's a lot of detail there which has to get worked out. Are the mechanisms you're talking to us about tonight the same ones that are applied intentionally in the GMO organisms, uh, genetically modified ones, and to follow up, these other elements, the so-called junk um, DNA, I know, it's painful. It's painful. I know, and my concern is people who think of it that way, do we understand it enough to understand its implications in these genetically modified organisms? Well, there, there, there are two, two answers because there's two questions there. One is about how does natural genetic engineering look compared to human genetic engineering? And it makes human genetic engineering look like child's play. <laughs> okay, I mean, if you look at, at the systems that have evolved naturally and the complexity of them, and the rapidity sometimes with which things can change, uh, it makes what we do in the laboratory seem uh, rather uh, poor, because we do it one little bit of DNA at a time. We can't do the kind of wholesale engineering that cells do. We may eventually learn how to trigger the cells and stimulate them to do their own genetic engineering and create organisms which will be useful for us in things like bioremediation and so forth. And uh, I, th I think that's a very promising uh, avenue. Now, as for genetically modified organisms, um, I was asked about this on my blog, and I responded, I didn't think that GMOs were necessarily dangerous to our health from eating them. But I thought that everything we'd learned about horizontal transfer and natural genetic engineering tells us there's no way that changes that have been engineered into these plants are going to stay in them. They're going to get out there, and we know that Roundup is already becoming useless and requiring huge doses of herbicide, and now you've got to have Roundup too, and, and so forth and so on. So I think in the end, these simple genetic modifications may be defeated by the processes that uh, are out there in nature to spread these changes around and get them into plants that we don't want to be proliferating next to our, our crops. Yeah. Thank you. You may have touched on this briefly with talking about fast mice and slow humans, but you've got all these mechanisms and our agents and mutability. How do you, how do you reconcile those with the persistence of genotype? <clears throat> well, they're under control. I see that, the, 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 you know, um, some people think that e either you, you, things happen accidentally or they don't happen at all. But what it, what, what, when something happens biologically, it happens under a control regime. This is what McClintock was talking about. And what molecular biology has taught us is that cells are full of circuits which control what happens in the cells. Now, in the case of all of these mobile genetic elements in our DNA, for example, we know that there is a memory system which tells our cells that and especially the cells in our germline, which are the ones that are important for evolution, that these elements have invaded. It takes fragments of their DNA and puts them in special genetic loci where they're transcribed into what are called interfering RNAs, which prevent the elements from working, and also target them for inclusion in what's called silent chromatin. That's an epigenetic modification. The, the DNA is bound up with protein and RNAs, and it can be done so in a way that the underlying DNA does not get expressed. And that's what happens to most of this DNA. It's, it's sometimes released from that and put into other forms of chromatin when it's active in cells. That's what the ENCODE project is telling us. But by and large, it's the epigenetic modification and the epigenetic silencing by encasing these mobile elements in silent chromatin. And probably what happens when there are a lot of these stimuli which stimulate mutability, we know that they also upset the epigenetic modifications of the genome and the epigenetic regulation. So it's probably through the epigenetic control 
that uh, these elements are being activated under stress conditions and that that turns out to be helpful for the organism in terms of changing when it has to change. That's a, that's a quick answer. And well, I was going to ask, well, let me ask something more specific then. Uh, primates, for yes. example, are very close. There's not a huge amount of difference, 3% right. difference between us and chimps. Uh, and if you look at, uh, there's been a lot of dating in, uh, uh, by paleontologists based on uh, uh, when when DNA diverged, etc. Uh, so, but it, there's there's a whole our our evolution seems to have more consistency and persistence of genotype than it does change of genotype. Well, there are certain rearrangements which distinguish us from our nearest neighbors, and there are certain movements of some of these mobile elements which are unique to humans that are not found in chimps. And I, I forgot to say that these elements can also be the source of new coding sequences. And so people are tracing these events and seeing what is it that makes a human different from a chimp. Right. It's a little more complicated than what makes a, a man different from a mouse. Right. But they're looking a lot at, at these elements and where they're different and where they've influenced uh, expression in different ways. So yes, the changes are relatively minor, but we think they're very important. Now, it may be that the chimps don't think they're as important as we do. Or perhaps they think they're more important. Or maybe they think they're more important. About halfway through your lecture, uh, where you use the term, cells know. Well, I was quoting Barbara McClintock, but... Uh, okay. Um, yeah, but just the term, um, you know, I guess I had trouble with the idea of a cell being so self-directed. Fundamentally, it's all biochemistry that they would know in a cognitive sort of way, because that's kind of how I understand the well, word cognitive know. Cognitive is the, is the word I like to use. And, really? And, and cells are always sensing what's going on inside of them and outside, and responding to that sensory information. And they do it pretty well. I mean, cell division is a pretty complicated process, more complex than any human manufacturing enterprise. Million, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of different events have to be coordinated, sometimes very quickly. E. coli replicates its DNA 2,000 base pairs a second and makes less than one in a billion mistakes because it has sequential proofreading mechanisms which are based upon monitoring the DNA and picking up those errors and correcting them. So this is a form of cognitive behavior. And I know we're taught not to anthropomorphize, although I do it all the time. It's the only way I understand what my bacteria are experiencing. And uh, uh, I think what McClintock is trying to tell us is we have to realize both that the, the cell is a sensory, a sentient entity. And it, it's using that sentience for its own needs and requirements and functions. And sometimes that involves changing its genetics, changing its DNA. But there's a whole school of, of study. Uh, one of the pioneers is in Seattle at the, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, Lee Hartwell, who got the Nobel Prize, I think, about seven or eight years ago for studying control of how the cell cycle progresses. And you may know about that. And the cell cycle, uh, the eukaryotic cell cycle, involves lots of different things that have to happen, and they all have to happen in a coordinated way. And the cell is monitoring how all of those things are happening. Operation, the cell is being monitored, it sends out signals, it says stop, don't go through cell division until we finish replicating the DNA. Once the DNA has been replicated, then the, the next step in cell division can, can happen. If a chromosome does not line up on the spindle pole in the right way, cell division cannot occur because a signal is sent out which prevents it. These are checkpoints. So they're based upon sensory, internal sensory information. And I'm not talking about metabolic regulation, which involves external sensing, or morphogenesis, which involves getting signals from other cells. There are all of this information coming into cells, and they, it's very common uh, language now to talk about the cell making this decision or that decision. Sometimes cells decide to undergo programmed cell death to commit suicide. And that's conditioned by what signals they find in the environment. 
If tumor necrosis factor is there, they die. If epidermal growth factor is there, they survive and repair whatever damage it is to put them in this, in this perilous state. So I don't have any trouble saying that these are cognitive processes. Uh, if you want to call them something else, call them something else, but we have to understand them. And we know they go on, we can enumerate the molecules which are involved, but what we don't really understand, and this is one of the things that McClintock was getting at, is how those molecules work together in a circuit-like or network fashion to make appropriate decisions. And, you know, this is a problem that's been with biology for a long time, because there are lots of sensory intentional things, evading predators, going after prey, going after food sources, and so forth. These are all reactions to sensory information. I don't know what you call them, if not cognitive. <laughs> but let, let me, as long as you don't call them self-reflective. What? <laughs> well, I, 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 I avoid the terms intelligence and consciousness because those are very loaded terms. Okay. That's why I like cognitive, because I think it's a good sort of neutral term that we can use and we can sort of experiment what, what does cognition really mean. And I think we might be willing to grant cognition, certainly to grant cognition to dogs and insects and worms, maybe the fungi, bacteria perhaps, maybe, who knows. Uh, but we can follow that. And this is a problem which has vexed biology for, for ever. And uh, most people don't remember that a lot of the, 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 the ideology that reigns in biology nowadays is not from evolution creation debates, but from vitalist mechanism debates. That's the issue that you raised. And the vitalists got wiped out because they would look at morphogenesis and say, well, cells have an idea of what they're doing and where they're going. And you could do experiments like you could ligate a frog embryo and make two small embryos. And cells which would have gone into one part of the frog's body change their, their fate map and now go into another part and get two small frogs out of it. So that system has some sense that it's going to become a frog. And how, what, 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 what is that information? Where is it stored? How is it executed? Now, the vitalists got totally wiped out because they had no scientific way of talking about that. But we have computers. We have the internet. We have networks. We have, we have neural nets. We have all kinds of things that we can use as models for trying to understand the molecular information processing that goes on in cells. And I think that that, too, is going to be one of the great tasks for biology in the 21st century, is figuring out how the cells do the right thing at the right time in the right place with such remarkable efficiency. I'm going to ask a very simple question, and um, you spoke to how your research, um, you know, in looking at the cancer. Um, has there been much research around autism um, at this? Could you speak to the research as well, it applies to yeah, autism? Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of research about autism. Uh, there are people who claim to have discovered certain. Uh, what, it turns out that. Because we've had these genome doublings, there are these what are called segmental duplications in the human genome. And there's a lot of variation in the numbers of these duplications which different people have. I may have one copy of a certain segment, and you might have two. Or I may have three, and you have five or six. And the, the tremendous variability has been discovered. It's called copy number variation. And there are people who study this intensively. Recently, people have claimed that they've identified some regions which have copy number variation that's related to autism. I'm uh, kind of skeptical about that because the problem is that autism probably isn't just one thing. And uh, our understanding of autism and our, our characterization of autism is, is very difficult. We have a good friends in, in, in England who have a child who is uh, deemed at four years old to be autistic. When he was seven years old, he greeted us, you know, with uh, a trombone and everything, and welcome to the house and so forth and so on. I said, there's no way this child is autistic. Now, people do grow out of it, and it, 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 it does have developmental implications. 
So I don't know. There are people looking for it. They think they found some things. But my own feeling is that uh, there may be other approaches to autism about how we deal with it uh, therapeutically that are more important. Uh, I was curious if you thought we were mutating, children, some of them are mutating to the environment that we live in now, which is well, less social and more. Well, the, the impact of chemicals in the environment is another thing, yes. So, and actually, uh, one of the, the, the great things is all these endocrine disruptors, which are in plastics which has gotten into the environment and into us. And there are experiments in mice showing that they can induce epigenetic changes, which can then be transmitted for many generations. And so, uh, could we be poisoning ourselves and inducing neurological deficits because of that? Of course we can be. And that's something to look at. Uh, I myself try to avoid water from plastic bottles. It's much better from glass or paper. And um, uh, I think there are lots of things out there that we're going to learn that are, are damaging us, uh, but we should uh, be more careful. Let's just do the last Hi there. Um, I basically came to ask you a question about someone that I have heard of, and that's Dr. David Swatter. Have you heard of him? He's a PhD. Uh, the name sounds familiar, but I, I, I can't say I really know him or what he's done. Yes, um, you stated that you were, um, it, it made you feel a certain way when people would talk about genetics the way they are now. What is that feeling again? I forgot. Well, it, it, it gives me a pain in my gut. Yeah, yeah, okay. When they talk about junk DNA, I mean, that's just so ridiculous. So, anyway, Dr. David Swatter, who's a PhD, has studied the resistance of science, and not just science, but engineering and other fields to new information. And he's done this for over 50 years, and he's, you know, talked to Google and HP and Intel. And he has... Are you trying to say that my colleagues are resistant to uncomfortable information? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Oh, heaven, heaven forbid, heaven forbid. Any colleagues are resistant to uncomfortable information. Anyway, I, I just think you should look him up. Um, he has various points along the way of how this resistance happens, and he did a, an amazing, you know, write-up on, uh, you know, washing your hands as a medical professional and the resistance to that. Oh, I'm familiar with that because you've heard of that story. But he has many more stories. Yeah, Otto Gawande had a thing in the New Yorker about this too. The one time I taught medical students, I said, "There's, there's, there's only two things I can teach you that are all useful." Wash your hands between every patient. This was about 15 or 20 years ago when they weren't doing it, and it was very dangerous. And never prescribe antibiotics unless somebody's life is in danger. It turns out that antibiotics, having taken antibiotics in the last six months is one of the prime indicators that you are going to undergo trauma and morbidity after surgery because the, the, the surgical trauma sets off certain triggers amongst the bacteria in your gut, which then affects your immune system. It's, it's a long story, so I don't want to, to get into it. Now, Thomas Kuhn, I don't know if you've read Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Well, he published this book in 1962, and it's not the first statement of this idea, but it, it's the idea that there are certain schools of thought, what he calls paradigms, and people get locked in those paradigms, and even though there's contrary evidence, it doesn't change their thinking. And you sort of have to wait for those people to disappear. <laughs> and, and, and I remember I was reading this book at, at a meeting in Santa Domingo, sitting by a swimming pool, and reading about Faraday and Dalton in the 19th century, and saying, wow, that's just like it is in science today. Wow, this guy really understands something. So that was published in 1962 by, I'm proud to say, the University of Chicago Press. And it's exactly about this issue. I mean, doctors were terribly resistant to washing their hands because with the, how could they be carrying infection from patient to patient? I mean, if you go back and look at the story of the infectious theory of, of disease, you'll find that Semmelweis, who went insane and was telling the doctors in Vienna this about childbirth back in the 19th century, had exactly the same problem. They, 
They couldn't believe that the doctors had to wash up between patients after each delivery. So, yes, that's a very So, uh, Dr. Sw Swatter has uh, put all this together in a you know, really cool package and he makes presentations. So. Well, is it, is it online? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, well, then everybody should try and find that. Thank you. The last two questions are Oh, I'm sorry. The church is going to kick us out. We're talking about evolution. <laughs> They, they, have, they do evolve, and you can track some of the evolution. Uh, but it, almost all cells have them. Maybe all cells have them from the beginning. Well, we don't know about the beginning. The beginning is unknown to us. It's like I told you when I told you about the three kingdoms of life. We just discovered a new form of life 40 years ago, less than 40 years ago. So we're in no position to say, in the beginning, how many forms of life were there. Maybe there was one, maybe there were hundreds. And this goes back to a long time ago. I think the ability to change is essential to life because every organism is going to go through crises. They're going to have to go through evolutionary bottlenecks. And if they can't change, they're going to be losers. So we're looking now at the guys that have survived the evolutionary crisis. So they're going to have these capabilities, and it makes good sense that they have these capabilities. What happened before, we're not yet in a position to know. Someday, maybe we will do, but right now, we, we just can't tell. Thank you. Last question. Good one, Dave. It's just a short answer. Yeah. Uh, well, my question is, since cells can sense their cell, should we perhaps be looking at there are maybe different kinds of consciousness? Or Different ways of knowing consciousness? Well, I'm going to get attacked by that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I think that's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, what I do say to the psychologists and to the people who, who study these issues, you know, uh, uh, in, in theoretically and philosophically and, and also operationally, well, let's ask about cognition of bacteria, or maybe in a yeast cell. That may be a lot easier than trying to figure it out in a human being or even in an animal. And we don't know what we're going to discover. Uh, uh, McClintock always used to say, you'll be amazed by what you find. And we have been amazed. Yeah, we're finding things every year that are amazing. So I think the things I've told some of you must have been amazing to you guys because they're not commonly known. So let's not try and do too much. Let's just ask the most basic question that we can, because we have to figure out how to attack it empirically. How can we do an experiment? How can we learn something about how the system operates? And if we try and be uh, uh, too ambitious, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to get a real experiment going. We have to take these things step by step. Uh, for those of you who are Jewish in the audience, it's the Dayan principle. You know, if you make one step, that would have been sufficient. If you make a next step, that would have been sufficient. If you make another step, that would have been sufficient. So, let's see if we can figure out how cells do one decision. If we can understand that, maybe we'll know how to ask the next more complicated question. But as to defining states of consciousness, I think that that's a, a big stretch right now. We may get there someday, we don't know. But right now, it's, it's too much to ask. And, and, and there will be enormous opposition to doing it, and it doesn't make sense to stir up that kind of